Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, cryptocurrency, fintech, cannabis, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful friends and loyal listeners. It's always such a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you so much for listening and interacting with me on social media. That truly does make it all worthwhile. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. And remember that we're now live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern. And we're also on YouTube at 2 p.m. Eastern. All episodes of A Moment of Zen are now available on demand and on YouTube. We have such a great show lined up for you today. In our Millennial Mom segment brought to us by OGPay.com, we are featuring the amazing Stephanie Arnold. She's a global thought leader, Emmy-nominated TV producer, international best-selling author, speaker, podcast host, and Netflix sleeper star. Today, we're chatting about her new book, 37 Seconds, Dying Revealed Heaven's Help, A Mother's Journey, Near-Death Experiences, and the Power of Intuition. In our beautiful segment by Adam Oka Brands, we are featuring my good friend, Sari Katz, former co-founder of Velour Medical and certified trainer for the Allergan Medical Institute. Today, she's joined by Passions actress Mackenzie Westmore and founder of the cosmetic company Westmore Beauty. Today, we're chatting fillers, dissolvables, and the potential pitfalls of injectables. In our business and buzz segment brought to us by Revere Securities, today we're chatting with non-executive chairman Kyle Wool, And he is joined by Alexa Rose Carlin, keynote speaker, author, and CEO of Women Empower X. Today we're chatting about the ongoing inflation crisis in America, how to stay ahead of the curve, and what the next 12 months look like for the overall economy. In my digital world segment brought to us by Tempest Network, we're welcoming back CEO of Tempest, Shahal Khan, joined by his good friend Alex Moore, former CEO of Boxing Boys. The Boxing Boys is a 3D animated NFT collection of 5,005 unique boxing characters with over 150 different elements. They combine the real boxing world with the digital revolution through a play-to-earn game. Those are on the rise. Today we're chatting metaverse, blockchain, esports, and how it all fits into the Tempest Network. Stay tuned for our Millennial Mom segment brought to us by OGPay.com featuring Stephanie Arnold, author of 37 Seconds. She'll tell us about how she basically predicted her own death. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions such as OGPay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OGPay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes in our Millennial Mom segment, brought to us by OGPay.com, we are featuring the incredible Stephanie Arnold, global thought leader, Emmy-nominated TV producer, international best-selling author, speaker, podcast host, and Netflix's very own sleeper star, That's a lot of accomplishments. Today, we're chatting about her book, 37 Seconds, Near-Death Experiences, and the Power of Intuition. Now, near-death experiences, or NDEs, are triggered during singular life-threatening episodes when the body is injured by blunt trauma, a heart attack, asphyxia, shock, and so on. You get the picture. About one in 10 patients with cardiac arrest in a hospital setting undergoes such an episode. Thousands of survivors of these harrowing touch-and-go situations tell of leaving their damaged bodies behind and encountering a realm beyond everyday existence, unconstrained by the usual boundaries of space and time. And these powerful, mystical experiences can lead to permanent transformations of their lives. Now, when Stephanie was pregnant with her second child, she had a sudden and overwhelming premonition that she would die during the delivery. Though she tried to tell the medical team and her family, no one gave her warning credence. Finding no physical indications that anything was really wrong, they attribute everything to hormones and anxiety. 
except one member of the medical team did take her concerns seriously enough and made the fateful decision to order extra units of blood just in case. Then during the delivery, Stephanie suffered a rare amniotic fluid embolism. She went into cardiac arrest and flatlined for 37 seconds. She died. Using the supplementary blood, the medical team did revive her and she remained unconscious for more than six days. And here to chat, 37 seconds, dying revealed heaven's help, a mother's journey is the amazing Stephanie Arnold. Welcome to the show, beautiful soul. Thank you so much for having me. What an introduction, that was awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, you are awesome. Please walk me through uh, what transpired and how you basically predicted your own death. Yeah, um, as you said, I was a TV producer, so I'm pretty good under pressure, live TV and, and what have you. So I'm not a histrionic, neurotic person before your audience thinks, oh, she must have been crazy. But uh, so during this pregnancy, this is my second child. So it's a second pregnancy, second childbirth. This wasn't the fear of the unknown, but at the 20 week ultrasound, I was diagnosed with something called a placenta previa, which is a one in 200 risk where the placenta is growing on top of the cervix. And worst case scenario is like as the belly grows, as the uterus grows, if it, um, you know, it should move out of the way. But if it doesn't, you could have a C section. But there was something in that moment that sat wrong. And I call it a knowing, you know, you don't know how you know, you just do. And I think we've all had these kind of experiences. Like I, I don't have science behind it, but I just know something bad is about to happen. And so I told my husband, who's a PhD economist from University of Chicago, former Air Force pilot, like very linear in his thinking, data driven. He's like, honey, you know, I said, I don't know what's wrong, but something really bad is about to happen. And he's like, you need to be calm. We don't have all the information, but you're getting great prenatal care. And, you know, I think you need to relax. And so, you know, what does one do, especially if you're kind of type A personality, you, um, you start being Dr. Google. And so I start Googling everything, placenta previa, what happens? And it says placenta previa can turn into an accreta, which is what Kim Kardashian had. It says, if it happens, then you can bleed. If that happens, you can hemorrhage. If that happens, you might need a hysterectomy. If that happens, um, you, you and the baby could lose your life. And I sat back and I said to my husband, I said, this is going to happen to us. The only difference is the baby's gonna be fine, but I'll be dead on the operating table. And of course, my husband is trying to keep me calm and he's like, relax, it's, it, it's not going to happen. All the tests are negative for what I'm fearing would happen. I sought out specialists. I went to the head of gynecological oncology at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, a top teaching hospital in the country. And they're like, Mrs. Arnold, why are you here? I'm like, well, I'm going to need a hysterectomy when I give birth. You're going to give it to me. So I need you to be prepared. And he's like, have you been on the internet? And I was like, well, yes, I have, but this is going to happen. And so, so you have to see like these doctors are taking notes and then stopping and saying, okay, she's crazy, you know? And so they're like, look, you know, why don't we get an MRI? If the MRI shows it's positive for an accreta, then, you know, I'll schedule myself during your C-section. And of course the MRI is negative for an accreta. And they're like, okay, you should be fine. My husband's like, you should be fine. And I'm like, but I'm not. And so then I took to Facebook. I posted, if anybody needs my blood type, I said, uh, I wrote goodbye letters. I sent goodbye letters. I, this woman stopped me on Starbucks and she was pregnant. She's like, oh, how's the pregnancy going? I'm like, I'm gonna die. Oh my goodness. I mean, every single person I saw was like scared of me, scared for me and just stayed away from me. And so ultimately um, at the 36 week, mark which i was supposed to deliver in 37 weeks 36 week mark my husband was out of town and um that's the day i started bleeding and had to go into the the hospital so i grabbed my daughter who was two at the time and we get to the hospital they triage me and i'm skype chatting with my husband on the plane as he's heading back from new york and i'm telling him you've made me the happiest woman in the world. Please take care of these children. You know, this is not his fault, the baby's fault. I'm like, you know, and he's still not getting it. So he's like, where do I meet you? I said, eighth floor, hopefully, you know? And so that was the end of that conversation. And then I look at my daughter and I kiss her a million times. I'm, I'm confident that this is the last time I'm going to see her. 
And then as they wheel me down in the gurney on the way to the, the OR, my doctor, who's a friend, she's like, Stephanie, I know you're nervous. You know, Jonathan's not here. We're going to take care of you. We just, you know, the ORs are quiet. You've been stressed this whole pregnancy. And, um, and I said, there's something wrong. You need to put me under general anesthesia. And she's like, I'm not going to do that. If I do that, I put the baby to sleep. And that's it. I mean, this is my last ditch effort. So I'm being wheeled into the room that's going to give life to my son and ultimately take mine. Wow. The, the fear was so palpable. It's like if you're, you know, I am seeing, you know, everybody's seeing an open road and all I see is an 18 wheeler headed straight for me and no one can see it. So the panic is there. I'm, I'm in, I'm having a C-section. So they put a curtain in front of my face and they deliver a healthy and happy baby. And seconds later, I'm dead. Now, when you experienced this, when, when you died and you, you felt your, your, you felt you left your body, tell me what, tell me what you experienced. Did you see everything unfold in front of your eyes and did you come back with more intuition? Yeah. So it's interesting to say, so, you know, after my recovery, I physically, I was getting better. I kidney failure, a heart attack. Like you said, I had an amniotic fluid embolism, a very rare pregnancy complication. And, um, and so no one can give me answers how I saw everything three months ahead of time because everything happened the way I said it was. I was hemorrhaged. I needed a hysterectomy. The doctor was called in afterwards. You know, the, the uterus and the placenta had merged, but the MRI didn't pick it up at the time. That was it. So everything happened exactly the way I saw it. And then- And the baby was fine though throughout all of it. The baby was perfectly fine. He was delivered prior to this God happening. Bless. And the doctors were like, how did you know? And I was like, I'm in a teaching hospital. You should tell me. And they're like, well, foreboding exists prior to an embolus or a heart attack, but three months before and the details you had it. So it set me on this journey. And I didn't recall anything about a near death experience until afterwards. I had been given a lot of drugs and, you know, everybody was like, did you see the light? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, they gave me a lot of meds, I, you know, and I was totally traumatized. So ultimately I saw a regression therapist who, um, regression therapy uses hypnotherapy to take you back into those moments of trauma. And so hopefully you can go in as an observer of these things and your brain stores these, these images as film strips in your head. And so under hypnosis, you can potentially access them. So I videotaped my therapy and during the therapy sessions, when we finally got into the OR, I saw who hit the button for the code, which nurse jumped on my chest to give me CPR, um, what my doctor was doing, what my anesthesiologist is doing down by my feet, that my doctor kept saying, this can't be happening, this can't be happening. And you can see a replay of this. We're on a Netflix show called Surviving Death, and we're in episode one of it. And so you see my doctor's reaction after her hearing and seeing these tapes. And, you know, in, in a moment, like afterwards, I felt better because I saw hundreds of spirits. I saw people that I knew, people that I didn't know. And then in that, in those moments, um, you know, after we were done, I was calmer. And so my husband was like, you know, how do you know this isn't a recalled episode of Grey's Anatomy in your head? That's and hilarious. I'm but, you know, I just want to interject right here because it's uh, interestingly enough, a 2017 study by two researchers at the University of Virginia raised the question of whether the paradox of enhanced cognition um, occurring alongside compromised brain function during a near death experience could be written off as a flight of imagination. And the researchers administered a questionnaire to 122 people who reported near death experiences. They asked them to compare memories of their experiences with those of both real and imagined events from about at the same time. And the results suggest that the near-death experiences were recalled with much greater vividness and detail than either real or imagined situations were. And in short, the NDEs were remembered as being realer than real. So obviously there's, there's a big difference there in, in the way that your memory plays things back. Um, it, is. it is. And psychologists have said, you know, of course, when you're having a near-death experience, you want your loved ones with you. And I said, that's fine. I'm, I'll, I'll put a pin in that one. But it's the point that I saw people I didn't know who had yeah. messages from people I do know. And I'm not a psychic, you know, but all of these messages started downloads. And then they were verified later by people I know that I'm like, there's no way I would have known certain things. And I, I write that also in, in the book. So in the book. Yeah, and the yeah. one member of the medical team that did take your concerns seriously enough and made that fateful decision to order the extra units of blood just in case, do you remain in contact with that person? 
I do. I taught at her hospital. I do continuing education at a lot of medical institutions. She's now the head of OB anesthesia at UPMC. And, and so she, you know, she, she said to me, she didn't feel like it was intuitive. She just felt like, okay, in that moment, she, it wasn't anything that would taught her at Northwestern medicine. She said, she's always been spiritual. She thanks God before she walks into a, a patient's room. Like there's a reason she's in their line of sight and she, she leads her life intuitively, but yeah. she's an excellent doctor. She ultimately flagged my file and incorporated extra blood in a crash cart in the operating room. And I had, I had, she was my last ditch effort with my consultations. I had like 10 different consultations with doctors and everything. And she said she was un, uh, you know, I explained my fears like I did to everybody. And she was the first doctor unbeknownst to me that said she was, she was, um, n- uncomfortable with, I'd had a baby before I'd had a C-section before had, been so specific about what was going to happen and had sought out specialists to save my life. And with that one phone call, she's the one that flagged my file and incorporated all the measures. To save I love it. Divine intervention. Well, we're out of time, but but I also want to add that near-death experiences, interestingly enough, came to the attention of the general public in the last quarter of the 20th century from the work of physicians and psychologists, um, Stephanie, but in particular, Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experience in his 1975 best-selling, uh, bestseller, Life After Life, uh, noticing patterns in what people would share about their near-death stories. These researchers turned a phenomenon once dismissed as feverish hallucination into a field of uh, empirical studies. So, and thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you so much. No, it was a pleasure. And you've done your research on near-death experiences. So it's, um, it's, it's been enlightening for all of us involved. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was our millennial mom segment brought to us by OGPay. I'm going to end with a special little prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Animoca Brands as a worldwide industry leader in digital entertainment, blockchain, gamifications, and digital property rights. Animoca Brands plays a key role in the future growth of the metaverse. Ranked by the Financial Times as a high-growth company, Animoca Brands creates a new asset class, GameFi economies, and a more equitable digital framework contributing to the building of the open metaverse. For more information and to become part of the excitement, go to AnimocaBrands.com. That's AnimocaBrands.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes in our Be Beautiful segment brought to us by Animoca Brands, we are featuring my good friend, Sari Katz, former co-founder of Velour Medical and a certified trainer for the Allergan Medical Institute with over a decade of extensive training in both medical and cosmetic dermatology. Today, she's joined by my very good friend, Mackenzie Westmore, passions actress and founder of the cosmetic company Westmore Beauty. Now, Mackenzie got into the beauty industry to help women feel sexy and amazing, but behind the scenes, she stayed hidden, staying out of sight to hide the effects of filler on her face that had unintentionally migrated over time. Today, we're chatting fillers, dissolvables, and the potential pitfalls of injectables. Most modern dermal fillers are composed primarily of hyaluronic acid, which is a naturally occurring constituent in our bodies. This gel-like molecule is a moisture-binding ingredient that helps, uh, the, uh, t- helps to keep the skin plump and hydrated, supports the production of collagen, and maintains skin elasticity, as well as being the main ingredient of most cosmetic fillers. Hyaluronic acid is what gives our skin its softness and our joints their fluidity. Now, in cases where dermal fillers produce an desired or harmful result, a reversal agent called hyaluronidase is injected into the skin to dissolve the filler. And hyaluronidase is a natural occurring enzyme in the body that works to break down hyaluronic acid, supporting its rapid and constant turnover. And here to chat some more is the beautiful Mackenzie Westmore and the amazing Sari Katz. Welcome, my beautiful ladies. 
Tizen, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being for having us. Yes, thank great to be here. Mackenzie, welcome back. You've come on. Uh, this is your third time. Three is not a charm because I'm going to keep keep inviting you back on. But uh, you are the to the people that don't know you, uh, you are the great granddaughter of British hairdresser George Westmore, who established Hollywood's first ever hair and makeup department way back in 1917, and one of the many Westmores, so to speak, who followed in his footsteps. Notably, um, you have the family a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for your family's contributions. To to the industry, yet here you are suffering in silence over bad fillers. What happened and where did your your journey with filler start? It basically started back in my 20s. Um, I was on a, on a show and I was basically a, a size four, size six, but that wasn't good enough for them. They wanted me to be thinner and they told me I was fat. And I started to lose weight. It spiraled out of control, suffered from anorexia, was hospitalized, was in the hospital, and even then that wasn't good enough. They told me I needed to get back to work. So the hospital wanted me there for six months. They told me to get back within two weeks. So I went back to work. Um, it was a, it was a tough journey to go through. So I had to work through that. And it, through that though, I, I even being a hundred pounds or less, my face had already been eaten away the muscles as, as you know, um, Sari, anorexia will eat away at the muscles in the face. So the, the cheeks, the, the, the temples, all the muscle was gone. So I then in my 20s turned to fillers to make up for that because I had to be on screen. This was my job and is my job. So I started to put fillers in at a very young age, which I would never recommend to anybody, as would any, any, anybody. Um, and that continued on. So that was my way to fix an issue quickly and continued on and then through then and then the aging process it just got out of hand and going from different doctors um it, it became too much the fillers got too heavy they they started to migrate they started to cause pain I, I even had my hair done at one point and started to have pustules in areas where the fillers were i was starting to get sick and i couldn't understand why no doctor could explain to me why i was getting sick and I really didn't understand what was going on until I went to see Dr. Paul Nassif. And that's when he said, this is out of control. This, this is too much. And he said, I need to deconstruct you to reconstruct you. And that's when he, I, I put my, my life basically in his hands. And I said, just do, do whatever you think needs to be done. And it was a process of two weeks for him to completely dissolve the fillers. And even then when he got me on the operating table, um, because I had so much sagging skin, this was two months ago. Um, he then uh, found that when he opened me up, there was still so much filler. He had to scrape it off my bones. He found it still integrated and wrapped around veins. Um, he had to extricate it very, very um, carefully. Um, it, it was it was a very tough, difficult situation. I, I know he, he even said he went on record with, with People Magazine and Access Hollywood that in his 23 years of surgery, he had never seen a case like this. Wow. So he had to really uh, be very careful in, in getting it out of me. Um, but he did say that, you know, even though it is a natural substance, there just was so much packed in there that it would affect the immune system. It still is a foreign entity to the body. And it, it would impact the immune system. Um, it just was too much for the body to handle. And nobody should go through this much filler or have this much filler put into their face over time. And Thank nobody you. would really guide me as to the amount of time or how much filler. You yeah. know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. I don't know how much should be put in through time. I just put my hands and my face in the hands of these people that I trusted when they weren't trustworthy. Right. Thank you so much for being honest and, and being so transparent and so open. I'm sure you are inspiring a lot of women and I'm sure it's hitting close to home for many out there listening and watching. Sari, I'd love for you to react to her experience and also give us your thoughts if this over-injecting is a thing and what can women do to mitigate the lumps and what fillers uh, do you recommend for long-term and prolonged use? But I'd love to get your reaction right now. So absolutely. Um, Mackenzie, I'm really sorry that you went through that. Nobody should have to go through anything like that. Um, and somebody along the way should have intervened and educated you on how to take care of you know, your face and what decisions to make. I'm, I'm big on education because in the industry, I'm actually a trainer. So I work for Allergan. I'm on their advisory board and I go around teaching best practices when it comes to 
uh, fillers and Botox, because you're absolutely right. There is a point in which we should not cross. So, um, you know, these things are temporary. However, to an extent with the buildup over time, we see fillers last years, even without adding more. Um, so yes, they're temporary to an extent. Uh, there is some that will remain under the surface and, and it really depends on how they're placed as well, right? Because if they're um, over injected on top of a muscle, they're gonna constrict the muscle. If they're injected in a certain plane of the face that the muscle will push a lot against, they can actually migrate and change location. Um, and the problem is when fillers first came out, there were there was so much less knowledge than we have now, and the uh, I think the mind frame was all right. Let's fix every every line and every fold, and just keep adding more. Just keep adding more. Um, and fortunately, now there's been a trend back towards a more natural um, approach as well as a more strategic placement. And I I find that in my industry, I'm trying my hardest as an educator to teach. The correct way that these products should be used so yeah. that we avoid having to dilute out because who wants to go through that extreme? yeah no, nobody injects to want to dissolve but exactly. you know the dermal fillers industry is um is very big from the year 2022 to the year 2029 there are they are forecasting astronomical numbers uh the expected global uh dermal fillers market is going to be around seven and a half percent higher year after year and the market was valued at over five billion dollars just this year alone and it's going to go to close to 10 billion dollars by the year 2030 so we're seeing a younger generation of patients and we're seeing people trying to attain perfection Mackenzie, uh for the filler reversal i know you 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 injected the enzyme uh hyaluronidase to to your face to dissolve them but that was not enough please explain uh, it was a process of about two weeks. Um, Dr. Nassif had a, a game plan of, of surgery because he knew that this was going to leave me basically looking like a Sharpay because there just was so much filler and it was going to leave a lot of sagging skin. And it was almost like going through weight loss where it was going to just sag. And, and if you see the before and after photos, which are coming out soon in part two of People Magazine, you'll see that it is, it's sagging. So it was two weeks that he took to dissolve the fillers in all the places that it had migrated. And I'm talking places like even close to my ears. I mean, just weird places where it had moved around. I mean, it was, it was embarrassing. Unbelievable. Where it had, it had just moved to places where I, I was... To be honest with you, I was thrilled through the pandemic that there was a mask and 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 glasses. I, I refused to take my mask off. Even when the mask mandates were being lifted, I didn't want to take it off because it just was embarrassing for me. I didn't like the way I, I felt or looked. And even down to where I had lost vision and didn't realize, I thought it was just because of aging. And when I went to go do my field test just recently, all my peripheral vision had come back because all the fillers that had been put up through here had all dropped. And so all my peripheral vision was completely gone. I thought it was normal that I had no peripheral and couldn't see above or around me. But now I can actually, like I'm looking at you and I can see all my peripheral, all that's back. Well, so you look beautiful. Back, you look beautiful. But you also you also said you were going to get a plain, uh, um, a deep plane facelift and endoscopic brow lift to help uh, add yeah. balance and and reflect your 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 former. So I had appearance. to. That it was really a reconstructive surgery. I had to because of all the fillers that were removed. It just left all this sagging skin. So in order, like Dr. Nassif said, in order to deconstruct me that's when he had to reconstruct me so he took the two weeks to deconstruct me he had a game plan of a surgery of doing a deep plane and an eye lift but even that changed the night before my surgery at 6 p.m night before my surgery he looked at me and said you know now that we've gotten the fillers out of you i can't do an eye lift i need to change it to a an endoscopic brow lift because the fillers were just so like migrated and moved around. I need to change my game plan now. So I just said, okay, I, I trust you. Let's do this. And yeah, we so have the about a minute day, and a half left. I just want to be mindful of the time, but yes, I mean, it sounds so like the next day we, we jumped into it and, and he, he did the, the lift, he ate everything. And even then when he got in there, like I said, he had to still remove more filler because it was so integrated into me and he reconstructed my face to be what you're seeing now. 
Interesting, interesting. Well, I'd love. I'm going to come back because I'd love to get some thoughts uh, on on uh, from Sari's perspective. But uh, we have come to the end of our segment. I want to thank both of you for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Mackenzie. And I want to thank you for your honesty, your transparency, and really sharing such private moments of your life and your struggles. But you've overcome them. You look gorgeous. You look beautiful. And you're such an inspiration, not only to me, but to all the women out there listening. Thank you. Sari, thank you so much for coming on. You know, I always love chatting with you, girl. Of course. Thanks for having us. And also, Mackenzie, it was a pleasure meeting you. And thank you for sharing your story. So wonderful meeting you. That was our beautiful segment brought to us by Animoca Brands. Dermal fillers boast a long record of safety when delivered by a qualified cosmetic injector. And in some cases, they don't. Though these problems are rare, it's essential to seek treatment if you experience any of these side effects or conditions. The reversal procedure must be performed by a highly trained cosmetic doctor with sound knowledge of the facial anatomy to achieve the safest and most accurate results. And Mackenzie Westmore, with her love of family and the heritage, she has taken all of that. She has created her own cosmetic line called Westmore Beauty, which can be found on the QVC, or you could head directly at westmorebeauty.com. Also, definitely check out Sari on the gram at Skin by Sari. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Animoca Brands as a worldwide industry leader in digital, entertainment, blockchain, gamifications, and digital property rights. Animoca Brands plays a key role in the future growth of the metaverse. Ranked by the Financial Times as a high-growth company, Animoca Brands creates a new asset class, GameFi economies, and a more equitable digital framework contributing to the building of the open metaverse. For more information and to become part of the excitement, go to AnamokaBrands.com. That's AnamokaBrands.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. Welcome back to our beautiful segment brought to us by Animoca Brands. We're chatting with the beautiful Mackenzie Westmore and my really good friend, Sari Katz. Welcome back, ladies. Thank you so Uh much, All right, let's talk. We're talking injectables, dissolvables, hyaluronic acid, hyaluronidase, reconstructive surgery. We're talking it all. We're getting down to the core um, of what really went down over the last decade for passion actress Mackenzie Westmore, really good friend of the show. We've had her come on now three times. She's always been nothing but honest, transparent, and downright completely, completely open and available to us emotionally to walk us through all her strengths, her struggles, and now how much she's just really overcome. All right, ladies, let's get back to this. So we're talking about the dermal filler industry. We're talking about um, injectables and dissolvables. Mackenzie, you just walked us through um, a very painful uh, moment in where you, Dr. Nassif, uh, really reconstructed your face as a result of over a decade of fillers having migrated to areas that you didn't even think possible. Uh, this, this, although is a rare and isolated case, it probably is happening more often than we think and even know of. It's probably not being reported. And more importantly, I think a lot of women don't have the financial resources uh, to be able to fix some of the stuff that goes terribly wrong. So this is great that you're bringing, you're shedding light to this because I think that a lot of women are kept in the dark. All right, so Sari, Mm -hmm. are you seeing a younger generation of patients and what are they looking for? So that's one thing I want you to address when you're answering your question. And I also want to touch upon, and then Mackenzie will help me with this one, what is the average customer's yearly spending on fillers and injectables? If we really look at it, right? Even because every mom is on Groupon trying to find the next good deal. And I think that's part of the problem. You have too many cooks in the kitchen touching somebody's face, right? And then also I'd like for you, Sari, to explain that if you are going to be using injectables over a prolonged period of time, what is your recommendation? I know I gave you a lot to unpack, but take it away. No, that's okay. Okay. Um, so as far as trends, what we're seeing right now, yes, you're 100% right. There is a, 
uh, decrease in age in which people start uh, injectables. And that's come with the whole uh, concept of baby Botox, right? Starting early and preventing, um, as well as a lot of trends like the lip trend that was started by the, uh, the Jenners and the Kardashians. So uh, yes, we are seeing a younger population come in, even as far as like Gen Z, millennials, everyone. So um, it's, it's been bigger and bigger, and especially with the Zoom uh, occurrence that we've had over the last two years, a lot of people are finding more flaws when looking at themselves in Zoom cameras. I'm sure to an extent we're even doing it right now, like looking, you know, what can we fix? What doesn't shadow right in this, uh, in this Zoom camera? Um, but, you know, it, it's still a very uh, sought after uh, concept or trend. And we see on average, I mean, it really depends uh, are we talking about full face rejuvenation or are we talking about baby Botox? If we're talking full face rejuvenation, uh, patients can spend like, you know, $10,000 a year. Uh, if we're talking about baby Botox, it depends also how often they're getting it. Um, but it might be more in the, you know, the 2000 range or so. Um, so basically what I tell my patients and clients are try to follow the guidelines, right? Even if you don't uh, feel like it's lasting, try to draw it out a little bit more. So Botox is indicated on the FDA approval package, the studies to last about three to four months. I won't uh, recommend injecting sooner than three months and fillers on average last about every, uh, about six months to a year, right? So um, instead of chasing lines and chasing uh, volume loss, um, I always like to maintain an air of a natural conservative approach, right? It's okay to have flaws. We're allowed to be asymmetrical. We're allowed to have little imperfections. That's what makes us human and natural. Well, I'm um, interested to know, Mackenzie, did you follow these guidelines as you were over the decade or were you way over that, th that ratio, that, that percentage that she's talking about? Way over. I was way over because I did not know. Um, you know, and this, I'm not trying to like say, oh, I, you know, I, I just, I take my own responsibility that, you know, I should have done my own research. I, I do take responsibility that, that nobody held anything to my head, but I, I should have done my own research. But I also was putting my, my trust in doctors' hands and some of these spas' hands to say, you know, oh, no, it's okay to do the filler three months later. It's okay to come back in two weeks and do more filler. I thought that was okay because I'm putting my hands in these professionals. Um, I, I'm putting my, my face in these professionals' hands to say that, that that's okay. And like you just said, to your point, sorry, that it, it, you know, it's to chase these areas. That's what I was trying to do is chase these areas. So you do one area, then another area doesn't look okay. So then you got to do that. And so we were trying to chase areas and then that's where it just got out of control. So no, it, it was uh, very close together and that's where it got impacted. So that, that is part of the problem of what I went through. Interesting. Thank you for that honest answer. Uh, Sari, let's bounce it back to you. So what are you going to, what advice do you give Sari to, to the woman who says, okay, I listen, I need maintenance. I'm going to see you often, but I don't want to end up with migration issues and lumps and having to dissolve. What do you say? So if, if finances are not an issue for that patient, um, what I do tell them is, look, uh, invest in that syringe. I might not use the whole thing. I might use a fraction of it. Um, but if that's what works with your lifestyle, doing it a little bit more often, then I'm going to have to inject less because that buildup over time is exactly what McKenzie went through. And I don't want to see that for any of my patients. So it's, it's up to uh, the patient to make educated decisions, but it's up to the provider or injector to help educate them so that they can make those correct decisions. And there's been plenty of times in my practice where I'll stop a patient and I'll say, uh, thank you for coming in today, but I'm sorry, I don't see any need for any more at this moment. Okay. Thank nice. You. Yeah. Nice. Now, That's do you, both of you, do you feel, Mackenzie, do you feel that you're, and I don't know if this is, you know, for somebody that used so much injectable over, over the last decade, Sari, you can answer this as well, but does your body need more the more you inject? Can your body get too used to an injectable? Um, so it depends if you're talking about Botox versus filler. 
Uh, of course, Botox, we don't like to inject more than the recommended um, frequency, which is every three to four months, because we don't want to build up resistance. We don't want to build up antibodies to, these, to this product. Um, but then as far as fillers, uh, honestly, like I said, I've seen fillers. For example, the under eye area is a very sensitive area. It's an area that can maintain fillers um, given the lymphatics and the, and the lack of uh, vascularity in this, er in this area, we can see fillers maintained for 10 years after they were placed. Um, so less is more. And that buildup over time is something that we can see, uh, even with dissolvable temporary products. Um, so can you build up a resistance to filler? Not exactly. Um, like, like we just explained, they can linger. Um, so really less is more, um, but and can premature use yeah. of Botox cause more wrinkles and lines down the road. So, you know, the thing about Botox, the longevity studies, longevity studies show a weakening of the muscle or what we call muscle atrophy. Uh, that is a thing that we do see, you know, over 10, 20, 30 years. In some cases, we want that muscle atrophy. If we have an overactive forehead that is creating a lot of, you know, those muscles are creating a lot of lines. Um, yes, but if we inject too much in that area, we can create laxity, right? So um, it's this balance of treating enough to see an improvement and a relaxation of that expression causing the lines, but not over injecting where we lose the tone of the muscle and things start to fall. Understood. So Mackenzie... Now that you have reversed it all, I, I'm assuming you are not going to be using injectables. What line of care and what beauty routine um, are you currently, what do you currently have? Also, what do you recommend and the products? I know you have amazing products in your Westmore beauty line. What were some of the, the products that you used at the time when your face wasn't looking the way you wanted it to? And also, what are some of your highlight products right now? The biggest product for me is the 60 second eye effects because it really is that that Botox in a bottle for 24 hours. I mean, it's temporary and it is topical, um, you know, and for me, that is my absolute go to um, to just it's I always call it spanks for your face because you it just sent it to me. I use it. I love it. <laughs> it really and I'm glad you love it. It really I is. It. it just kind of holds it all in place. So that is my absolute go to. You know, all my products really are illusions. And it is great for that no makeup makeup look. Um, so that is definitely my go to, you know, the body coverage. Obviously, I like to add a little dab of that into my foundation for that that flawless um, foundation look, um, you know, the shadow edit uh, to edit out any any imperfections in the skin. Um, so many of my products with the 60 second eye effects has really become that, that end all be all for me, especially now because it is that topical Botox, if you will um, for me to go, to go to. And then as far as, as that for makeup to create more of that illusion, other than that, it's, it's going to be really good skincare. It's going to be, in fact, skin medica, I, I know, which is an allergen product that is, is my, my absolute favorite. Um, other than that, uh, laser treatments, uh, pro fractional, um, broadband, um, micro, uh, needling, um, microdermabrasion. Um, I'm, I'm really going to stick with more of the, the topical laser and just really good treatment. You know, I was never big on SPF. Well, I, I sure am now, and I'm going to be very much about the anti-aging and really taking good care of me now. And from here on out, just aging gracefully. Oh, you are so beautiful. And you said all the right things and you're every dermatologist poster child at this point. Um, <laughs> It's the truth. But I will say to you, Mackenzie, that I used, um, it was the body coverage this summer uh, in Italy and in Mykonos uh, while I was in full bikini. Like, let me tell you the obsession I had with this body coverage stuff. So you sent it to me. And I was like, one day I had this crazy bruise on my leg because I was kickboxing. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put a little bit. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'll put it more than a little bit. Oh, my, I like the way my skin looks better with this. So here, wait, wait, wait. so here I am smearing, like smearing everything, thighs, butt. Now it's like changing my skin color. I'm like, uh-oh. what? And now I can't get this thing off, right? And my husband's going, let's go. We got to go to breakfast. And I'm like cleaning up. And now I'm thinking, oh, is this going to stay in the seat? Like what's going to happen now? Well, sure enough, I get to the restaurant, nice white seat, and I hadn't let it dry. 
So my first experience was it left a little bit of a stain, but then you know what? It never came off for like three days in the ocean at the pool after it dried, it stayed. And everyone was like, oh, you've been working out. Like your your cellulite's gone. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. My cellulite's gone. Sure it is. It's just covered. It was awesome. It's funny because I just did a QVC and I, I put it on one arm and I didn't put it on the other one. And even I was like looking in the camera and I was like, I think I just want to do the entire cell from like this side because it just looks so much better and tighter and leaner. And I was like, yeah. I don't want to turn this way right now because this arm's not done. But it's one of those products again where it just it's topical. It just makes you feel good. And that's what Western Beauty is all about is just products that make women and men feel great about themselves that just make you walk out your door and feel that confidence. Because I know personally, I lost my confidence for so many years and I never want to go through that again. And I don't want anybody else to go through that. So that's really what I want to bring forward through my story and through Westmore Beauty. Yeah. And you're a great mom. I mean, oh, geez, I've seen you and and I've seen your, your family and you're so blessed and beautiful. And and honestly, the industry probably broke you down and you built yourself back up in ways that are your your kids you know look your family you have some you have a legacy to leave behind now and with the ability uh for you to be able to take your imperfections and turn them into strengths the way you did the way you opened up that's true talent forget the rest the rest is just camera so thank you for coming on you're amazing thank you sweetheart sari you are awesome full of knowledge you know i love you no matter what you are my my number one bestie out there. There's no one else I would trust with my face but you. There are some amazing plastic surgeons out there that I absolutely think are incredible. And yet, you're the one I go to, my darling. So thank you for servicing my face. You are very welcome. And it's a, it's honestly a, an honor, right? It's such a pleasure, such a joy. Every time I see you, I feel like I have to block out the schedule so I can hang out with you. Um, <laughs> It's awesome. And I'm just so honored. And it's, it's been an honor getting to know you, Mackenzie. And once again, thank you for sharing your story. I think more people need to share stories like these. Thank you. I, I, it's so wonderful to meet you. And I, I really do hope that, that more women, and like I said, and men do listen to this and take note of this to, to really listen to people like Sari and, 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 you know, really do their knowledge, you know, don't, don't grab that group on. I mean, you wouldn't grab a group on for a heart surgeon. So why would you for your face? Oh, so that that's cool. my that biggest message. <laughs> that, yeah, really don't, don't get that, that coupon. Don't just really take your time. Do your, 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 your not do your searching, do, do your, you know, research, you know, really, I, I can't implore enough to people out there, you know, take your time. Your face is just as important as the rest of your body is your health is everything. So this, this is important. Anything you put in it is important. So I just, I plead to everybody, take your time, do your research. Take your time, do your research. You heard it right here on 710 WR. Mackenzie Westmore, thank you so much. Guys, that was our beautiful segment brought to us by Animoca Brands. That was the beautiful Mackenzie Westmore and the lovely Sari Katz. Make sure you're checking them out, westmorebeauty.com, and definitely check them out on the gram at Skin by Sari and at M Westmore. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams, iHeartRadio. In our business and buzz segment brought to you by Revere Securities, we're chatting with non-executive chairman Kyle Wool. And today we are joined by Alexa Rose Carlin. She's a keynote speaker, author, and CEO of Women Empower X. Today we're chatting about the ongoing inflation crisis in America, how to stay ahead of the curve, and what the next 12 months look like for the overall economy. Federal Reserve officials and their counterparts around the world are trying to defeat inflation by rapidly raising interest rates, knowing full well it will come at a cost. Inflation has been relentlessly rapid for a year and a half now. The longer that remains the case, the greater the risk that it's going to become a permanent feature of our economy. What happens in America affects the entire world. Case in point, 
One day after the Federal Reserve lifted interest rates sharply and signaled more to come, central banks across Asia and Europe followed suit, waging their own campaigns to crush an outbreak of inflation. Policymakers around the globe are simply worried and downright frustrated. And here to chat some more are my experts at hand, Kyle Wool and Alexa Rose Carlin. Welcome to the show, my dear friends. Thanks for having Thank me. Yeah, thank you. Kyle, let's start with you. So many, uh, many economists think that what happened in the 1970s when the Fed tolerated out of control price increases for years and allowed an inflationary psychology to prevail uh, and later proved excruciating to crush. They're fearing that's about to happen now. What are your thoughts? I think there's a possibility it could happen. Do I think it will happen? Probably not. I think we have very positive things on the short-term agenda. I think we should have an election, if you look at most of the forecasts, that should swing the House in a different direction. And gridlock is very good, typically, for the economy. And I do think if the other party takes control of the Congress, we will not see the rampant spending that we're seeing today. And I think that'll help tamper inflation, because inflation is not just controlled by the Federal Reserve Bank. Monetary policy is important, but it's also important to control spending, to control the monetary supply, how much is out there as well. I think if we can control the spending, if we can continue to raise rates, and I don't think we need to raise them that much more. I think maybe another 75 basis points. And if we can get a little help from our friends in Eastern Europe and tamper that war down, I think you'll also see some of the commodities such as oil, gas, and wheat come down as well. And if you can have those three together, kind of like the three a year ago that started this, those three can kind of bring it down without having to raise rates like Chairman Volcker to 20%. Yeah, exactly. Because if you think of it, in the 1970s, uh, the Fed policymakers did lift interest rates in a bid to control inflation. But to your point, they backed off when the economy began to slow. And that allowed inflation to remain elevated for years. And when oil prices spiked in 1979, it reached untenable levels. The Fed, under Paul Volcker, ultimately raised rates to nearly 20 percent and sent unemployment soaring to more than 10 percent in an effort to wrestle the price increases down. And, and that example seems to weigh heavily on policymakers' minds today. Um, Alexa, already the moves are beginning to have an impact. Climbing interest rates are making it more expensive to borrow money to buy a car or a house in many nations. And mortgage mortgage rates in the United States are, are back above 6% for the first time since 2008. And the housing market is cooling down. Uh, the markets suffered this year in response to the tough talk coming from central banks, uh, to Kyle's point, reducing the amount of capital available to big companies and cutting into household wealth. What is your advice to women out there who are managing their household finances and are trying so desperately to balance the family budget? Yeah, I mean, the first thing um, that I always tell everyone is that knowledge is power. And when you have a good understanding about where your money is, how much is coming in, and really that safety net, um, I think that it's super important right now to make sure to have somewhat of a safety net and really focus on building that because we, you know, the future is unknown. And right now, like a lot of people are looking to, to fear and, and un unsure of like the spending habits, unsure of what's happening, even in, like with the holidays or can I buy a new house? Can I get a new car? And so if you understand your overall financial health, it helps a lot. Um, also help you feel secure in making those choices and definitely make sure to talk about it with your partner, with your family. Um, that's very important. Me and my husband talk about our finances every single day and we are on the same track with goals. So it's really about uh, balance because fear is never the answer. And so I think it's just really important. The first tip is to make sure you understand your complete financial health and know what you can spend money on, what you can still enjoy, as well as where you're saving for if it's a house, if it's a car. And do you need those things right now or can you hold off with that purchase? Yes, uh, financial literacy is what it boils down to, and that's at the heart of it all. Uh, Kyle, rates are rising from low levels, and the latest moves have not yet had time to fully play out, so to speak. And just recently, we just saw these numbers, uh, you know, 
with the feds. But in continental Europe and, and Britain, the war in Ukraine, rather than monetary tightening, is pushing economies towards recession. It's, it's different here. Here in the United States, the fallout from the war is, is far less severe. Hiring in the job market remains strong, at least for now. Consumer spending, while slowing, is not plummeting. That's why, ultimately, the Fed believes it has more work to do to slow down the economy, even if that increases the risk of a downturn. This feels counterproductive. Many economists would disagree. What are your thoughts? Again, I think we have to take interest rates in context, right? They just went from zero to three, right? Now, if you look at them historically, okay, sure, the mortgage rate went from you could get a 30-year mortgage at 250 to probably 6.3 right now. These are historic normals, okay? This is not 12%. This is not 20%. Like when my parents probably bought their first house in the late 1970s, they probably had a 24% mortgage when interest rates were at 20%. Everyone nowadays in the world that we live in, it's the next tweet, it's the next thing, it's whatever happens on the next internet, right? But this is the mean average. 3% is a pretty healthy place. It's good for a healthy economy. If we go to 375 or even 425, okay, maybe it's a little high. It's not the end of the world. People should get more comfortable with this. Now, one thing that it may affect people is access to EC capital. People are used to using their HELOC to borrow money very cheaply. That's not cheap anymore. That's me five and a half, six, seven percent. You want to borrow money off your investment portfolio. I'm an investment person. People borrow money off their portfolios. That's no longer two and a half percent. That's going to be five, six, seven, eight percent, depending on how much capital you have. And that's a life lesson for people that when you do have, have historic lows like we had for the last five years, Maybe not a bad idea to lock in a 30-year mortgage. Take advantage of these things. A lot of people haven't been in the market that long, and history is not a guarantee of the future, but it's a pretty good indicator. So I would say I wouldn't get nervous. It's a historic average that we're at right now. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, if you look at it from the bigger picture, um, this isn't the 70s at the end of the day. And inflation hasn't been elevated, to your point, for as long. And supply chains appear to be healing and measures of inflation um, expectations remain under control. It's not totally out of control. Um, interestingly enough, Mr. Brooks at the Institute of International Finance sees the pace of tightening in Europe as a mistake and thinks that the Fed, too, could overdo it at a time when supply shocks are, are fading and the full effect of recent policy moves have yet to play out. So, you know, we don't know where this is going. But Alexa, I'll flip this one to you. Um, how can families stay ahead of the inflation curve, Alexa? And what advice do you have to the individual who is trying to get onto the proper path to financial freedom? I mean, the best way to stay ahead of the financial or the inflation curve is to make sure to look at, you know, what, how is that, how that's going to affect you? Like, are you looking to buy a new car? And then if you are, can you buy it now before we think that the price that it's going to go higher or can you um, sustain with not buying a new car? And maybe like, how long is that going to be? Is that going to be a year or two years? So it's really understanding sacrifice and where is this going to affect you? Because if you look and listen to all the news out there, it's not every single thing is going to affect you and your family. So that's really important. And for the individual, I think it's, it's about, again, the knowledge, but also understanding the sacrifices. It's not forever. Um, I think that uh, a, a big problem with especially my generation is that we look online and we want to buy all these fancy things to keep up with like the influencers and the social media. And a lot of those things are people that are in a lot of debt. And so it's really, it's, it's thinking about what kind of life do you want? And what does that look like? And what's important to you is family time to go out to dinner important to you. Maybe that should be in your budget more so than buying, you know, a brand new uh, wardrobe or car or designer bag, whatever that looks like. And so for the individual, you really want to think about what's important to me and what do I need to factor in my budget so I can still live my life to the fullest that I'm able to, as well as plan for my future and make sure that me and my family are okay. Well said, well said. Kyle, and of course, we can't forget Alexa, making sure that we have a, a great financial advisor 
um, on our speed dial to be able to make sure that all our investments are being done properly, safely, and effectively. And that's what I love about Kyle at Revere. You guys are very, very hands-on. You know your customers very well. You know everything within the portfolios and everything that you're looking um, to make investments and pull the trigger for. So Kyle, very, very trusted source. Um, Kyle, where do you think we're headed in overall in the next 12 months? What's your opinion? And what asset classes seem the safest to invest during this volatility, this volatility really to hedge against inflation? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I like what Alexa is talking about, the day-to-day -day prudence of how to run your household. I think that's very important. I think it also goes to your portfolio. It's very important. Now, if you look at the stock market over time, the stock market goes higher. Good times last longer than bad times last. We're in a difficult economy right now. I think the economy is strong, but the market looks bad. You see the Dow Jones Industrial Average for the S&P 500 have come down quite a bit. It actually broke 30,000 on the downside the other day. So what do you do in this time? Do you sell all your stocks and run away? Probably not a good idea. They're probably going to be higher over the next 12 to 18 months, right? But you start to look at, okay, maybe rebalancing the portfolio, right? Saying, you know what? In a difficult time, consumer staples are still going to do well. Like Alexa was saying, you're still going to go shopping. You're still going to buy toilet paper. Companies like Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola, Kraft Foods will continue to do well. Maybe if you're looking for some yield, energy stocks, energy doing quite well. We've got a four and a half percent yield. Not a bad thing to look at. Utilities do well in this kind of market as well. People are still going to use electricity. And again, you're always going to have tech stocks that are out there. Maybe not bad to pick up some Apple cheaper than it was, 30% off the highs, to pick up some Amazon. Would I go out there and trade Bitcoin and buy it rock, buy a blockchain? Probably not. But I do think it's a time to look at your portfolio, see where your position. If some of your gains have out, outpaced where they should be in your asset allocation model, maybe bring those back and be a little bit more defensive. But the next thing you know, typically in the markets, when woe is near and the end is near, et cetera, markets usually do pretty well. So when the average investor gets scared, you should be greedy. And when the average investor is greedy, like they were six months ago, maybe you should be fearful. I think Warren Buffett said that best many years ago. I like that. I'm going to coin that. That's going to be the new uh, president of Reverse Securities uh, quote. Well, I think Buffett might sue me for that, but I think he traded <laughs> yeah, but it. He, he probably did, but you just put your own spin on it. I love it. Um, <laughs> well, listen, we're almost out of time, but Alexa, any closing thoughts? Uh, my closing thoughts is, uh, you know, the more that you can uh, be knowledgeable about, again, your financial health, your your budget, where you your goals are regarding what you want to spend on, how much you want to have saved, that's going to be the power through this time. And don't, you know, don't result to taking in all this information and hearing and believing everything that you hear, because fear is definitely not a good place to be. Um, as long as, you know, you have that safety net and you understand what you're spending money on, how much money that's coming in, I think that you're going to be fine. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome work. Thank you so much. Wise words, my dear friends. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on and shining us with your, your, your knowledge and making sure that you're always guiding us in the right direction here in our business and buzz segments. Thank you. Thank you. Roxanne. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Alexa, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. Guys, that was our business and buzz segment brought to us by Revere Securities, one of the most trusted broker dealers right here in New York City with such an array of investments and portfolios and really a personalized one-on-one -on -one, uh, service that they offer to their clients. You definitely have to check them out, reveresecurities.com and check out Alexa at alexacarlin.com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Tempest, the next generation of the engagement economy, allowing people to make money on their data and earn cryptocurrency for the time they spend on things they already currently love to do. With Tempest, brands will have the ability to pay you directly for interacting with apps, watching videos, playing games, and more. Tempest, the time is now. Engage and earn. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Welcome back to My Digital World segment brought to us by Tempest Network. And welcoming back to the segment is our regular contributor, CEO of Tempest Network, Shahal Khan. He is joined by his friend, Alex Moore, former CEO of Boxing Boys. 
Now, the Boxing Boys is a 3D animated NFT collection of 5,005 unique boxing characters with 150 different elements. They combine the real boxing world with the digital revolution through a play-to-earn game. Today, we're chatting metaverse, blockchain, esports, and how it all fits into the Tempest Network. Video games play a central role in the creation and expansion of the metaverse, and gaming platforms are uniquely positioned to influence the metaverse business overall. The metaverse, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is a 3D interactive virtual world built on the principles of Web 3.0 and aims to provide consumers with a 3D entertainment experience. There are many blockchain-based metaverse worlds like the central land or the sandbox. Now these gaming platforms are positioned to be incredibly influential in metaverse business opportunities as the gaming world and deeply ingrained user base is already at the forefront of new metaverse exploration. And this immersive hybrid model brings esports fans engagement to completely different levels and the growing, especially Indian gaming industry has the potential to leverage this opportunity to shape the metaverse technology and become a global front Runner. Now, the metaverse will open up an infinite number of options, which is why the gaming sector and government must work together to put in place regulations so that the early adoption of metaverse will regulate the industry, not destabilize it. This will give rise to the creator economy, and it will build on the principles of decentralized finance. Here to chat some more are my experts at hand. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hi, Zen. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Alex, I'll start with you. Uh, the growth of esports, for those not familiar with them, uh, are characterized by regional or international video gaming events and professional or amateur players who compete in them against each other. It's a big, big market. And according to Statista, the global esports market value grew by 50%, Alex, in 2021 to just over 1.8 billion US dollars. Now, experts are predicting that it's going to grow even further to as much as almost 2 billion by the year 2024. Four. And at present, Asia and North America are the biggest markets revenue wise. Esports are especially big in China, uh, which accounts for almost one fifth alone of the market. How is Boxing Boys changing up the game and space? Well, Boxing Boys is um, <clears throat> the one and only play to earn game now, which is developing in this uh, industry. So, of course, uh, we take advantage of the market and uh, take advantage of what's coming. So we was um, uh, back in 21, we were seeing this coming. And uh, of course, then we uh, wanted to develop something that we have passion for. And that's NFT in crypto space. And of course, Metaverse, which is the future. Yes, of course. And, if, and according to GamesPad, Alex, the gaming market is going to is set to grow from the current 3 billion users to 4.5 billion users by the year 2030. Uh, U.S. consumers spent an estimated 60.4 billion on gaming uh, from the years 2010 to 2021. And about 60 percent of in industry experts believe gaming is going to dominate the virtual reality uh, VR related investments in the next few years. Which brings me to my next guest, Shahal. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks, Dan. Thank the, you. Gaming, the gaming industry, we've talked about this before, is always hungry. And with blockchain by its side, we can only see the disruption uh, even more clearly from ownership to royalties, from finding rare items to acquiring trinkets. Uh, the three billion gamers worldwide are all set to get more from this uh, technology you know, so to speak. And blockchain gaming relies on blockchain tech to ensure everyone owns a copy of what they are playing, not just one entity. Um, we accomplished this, Shahal, we've been saying this over and over again by the use of smart contracts, which governs actions on the blockchain. And blockchain uses the same tech as cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin and Ethereum, to create true item ownership. What are the key drivers and market trends for this ad adoption, in your opinion? And tell me how this is all related to Boxing Boys and Tempest. Yeah. Well, Zen, you know, what um, we saw was that we wanted to take a uh, platform that uh, could be sort of um, adapted to the actual financial transactions on the DeFi network and uh, melded with, let's say, um, in, in gaming aspects of looking at um, a person's actions, uh, attributes, uh, the amount of time that they spend um, on an actual gaming platform. And then um, we can create an ability for them to develop a sort of a player score, a reputational score, and have them back end that into 
um, data buyers that would be able to compensate those players for their time spent and their level of expertise. So in my search for looking for a possible gaming partner that can do that, uh, we needed a, an aspect of a game that is being uh, created that hasn't uh, fully launched yet, you know, but uh, we could incorporate these aspects of the financial side of, let's say, play to earn or, or engage to earn, right? Both of them at the same time, because there hasn't yet been a game that does both where you play to earn. So you're kind of paying into the game in order to achieve larger amounts of compensation, but you're also engaging and earning within the system. And within that system, you're able to actually take your um, actions that you've uh, you know uh, finalized and you're able to then get compensated for those. And those are a record on the blockchain. So with this, I think, you know, this is going to be a unique opportunity to see Boxing Boys develop into that. Interesting, because uh, now let's get Alex's uh, to pipe in here, his opinion. But the Boxing Boys collection, Alex, to my understanding, is made up of dynamic non-fungible tokens, DNFTs. And a dynamic NFT is an NFT that can change based on external conditions. Change in a dynamic NFT typically refers to changes in the NFT's metadata triggered by what I originally said, the smart contract, which is at the base of it all. And the blockchain behind this advanced technology, in your specific case, is Chainlink. Um, I know that Chainlink is an off-chain data delivery service that can securely deliver external data into smart contracts where it can be used to update a DNFT. Talk to me about the Boxing Boys monetization model. Yeah, so <clears throat> why we choose to use this is, of course, um, um, the NFTs is, uh, is uh, made up of, the, like you said, dynamic uh, non-fungible tokens. Uh, and uh, put, put simply, uh, a dynamic NFT and NFT that can change based on external conditions uh, and it's change, uh, then, uh, change in a dynamic NFT often refers to change in the NFT metadata triggered by a smart contract. So that's why we're using it. And when this monetization model seems pretty, pretty simple, but yes, it's a bit more complicated and different than your other play to earn monetization models. How does it differ? Yeah, so the, the previous uh, NFT collection we had was, uh, was basically the art collection, which is, uh, of course, a fantastic collection. It's unique in many aspects. And uh, the next collection that we're coming with, I don't know if you know, but we will come with another collection, which is then the, uh, the uh, NFTs. And this will be uh, a more integrated NFT that you can use uh, more widely. Interesting. Yes, because I know that the first Boxing Boys collection launched and sold out in December of 2021. And since then, right. I know that you guys have partnered uh, with a game development company called Radic to build the industry's essentially best play to earn esports NFT boxing game, which is what you're doing. Shahal, mm -hmm. game developers today are, are really mm -hmm. more focused on economic incentives and, and it's rapidly becoming the most important feature for metaverse gaming projects. And monetizing games is keeping players really interested and invested. And it's the decentralized finance that's allowing all of this to, you know, making this possible. We see more gaming projects expand and utilize technology like augmented reality, AR and virtual reality, VR. Uh, we will also notice that metaverse games will have incentive structures that allow players to earn real world income. What is your vision with the Tempest model? Yeah, well, you know, uh, first of all, you have to have um, the right AI and the right ML and, the, uh, you know, to be able to, um, look at a user's identity and then uh, across the board, develop a habit range and a skill range for that person uh, that is participating. Uh, it, you know, it's gonna start from games and then it's gonna go into people's actions in the metaverse, right? Yeah. Because at the end, as AR and VR takes over, uh, people will have reputational scores or skill scores that are going to be able to represent them in even avatar form. But behind the scenes, you're gonna have to have and you talked about regulation, uh, uh, Zen. This is going to be very important for governments and um, corporations and other people interacting with other people to understand who they're dealing with. Not only their levels of skill play or their levels of interaction, but who they are, where they're coming from, where they're earning from, where they're trading from, in order, uh, as this becomes larger, to be able to um, you know, create everything from taxable income to be able to actually... Um, regulate 
um, the actual uh, uh, platforms that are offering these income streams. Because at the end of the day, governments want some taxation, right? Uh, this can't be completely offshore. But in order to integrate this into these kind of platforms initially and do it in the right way, will allow uh, regulatory environments to coexist with these developers. And I think Dubai and the UAE and, and, and other regions are doing a lot of things to this nature, um, you know, uh, to develop uh, not only technologies on the ground that are fast, that are low cost, that are secure, but also allowing them to be uh, put on regulated exchanges and platforms where people can, you know, tie in DeFi wallets, be able to buy NFTs, receive income as well in those NFTs, and then those could be reported back to the exchange and then, you know, back to, I guess, uh, whatever uh, the government entities are that want at that, you know, certain point in time, that knowledge. And that's very important for this to become now a real kind of platform for engagement and earning and, and going forward. Yes, we definitely transparency and regulation. It's at the core of it all in order for for any of this to make sense. Um, Alex, one of the main issues facing, uh, for instance, the um, the Dubai metaverse or the United Arab Emirates uh, gaming industry is the shortage of personnel and expertise needed for chip manufacturing and animation, visual effects, gaming and, and comic developments, AVGC. What kind of infrastructure do you have at Boxing Boys to ensure proper delivery of gaming and the game Fi in your ecosystem? Well, this is very easy to answer because we are working with uh, basically one of the best. So, and plus we are, we are well integrated in the, in the community here and we have a lot of collaborations which is uh, uh, suiting us very well. So we, we will do good, that is for sure. Understood, understood. Now, mm -hmm. what kind of marketplace are you curating and how are you building your community? Well, we have, of course, we're using Discord and we're using different kinds of marketing aspects. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, now we are moving into Metaverse as well, which is going to be a huge community through everybody implementing their services into Metaverse. Of course. So, mm -hmm. Extreme, extreme, extremely important. Uh, Shahal, the future gaming Metaverses may also uh, decentralize gameplay. That's what we're talking about, which means the users will have a say in how the game progresses. And decentralized gaming organizations will enable users to vote for how the story goes forward and how a game asset needs to be valued in the market or even in the design of the gaming NFTs. Furthermore, users who require an original NFT in the game can earn a continuous royalty on that NFT in the open market. How is this solving real world issues and is it paving the way out of poverty for some? Oh my God. I mean, there's so many things. There's aspects of uh, media that is not going to be controlled or governed by one entity, right? Media in terms of uh, this, this can flow into news, this can flow into content creation, um, you know, so many things, right? It's, it's really putting the power of what information, what content goes out there in the hands of uh, groups of people that um, are now tied into that sort of information stream. So I do agree that that could be a great sort of part in terms of a dual world of, uh, you know, real life gaming, but as well as content creation with small groups that want to have differentiated voices, right, that are, that are not... Um, obliged or controlled by a central source. Like, right, you know, the old days movies, somebody produced them and sent them out there because they like the storyline. The news today is completely controlled by a small group of people. This is really, I think, the beginning of truly freedom of speech once again. And, um, you know, uh, on one side, there could be regulation, which has to do with money, right? Because at the end of the day, governments today still need money and, and want to collect money. They're all in debt. But on another um, side, you have freedom of content and expression that anyone in the world is gonna be able to participate in regardless of their country or their government or wherever they are, it's, it's actual freedom. So I think this is gonna be a very exciting time to have decentralized um, you know, content uh, creation uh, based on these gaming platforms and, as, as, and later on media platforms. Yeah, it's very important. Without a doubt, we have 1.7 billion people in this world that are unbanked and or underbanked. But what they all have access to is a smartphone and they could play games on that on that smartphone and mm -hmm. they can earn, you know, on the blockchain and they can convert their crypto into fiat currency and they could, you know, make their five, ten dollars a day. So this is all uh, very, very interesting, very proprietary and really the rise of the creator economy. With that, we are out of time, my dear friends. Alex, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure chatting with you. 
Thank you so much to, to all of you. Thank you, Shahal. Thank you so much for always piping in. Your expertise is invaluable. And of course, we love hearing you simplify this and make sense of it all and really just show us on how this is paving the way for, for outside of the U.S. and how this is really changing lives all over the world. So thank you for coming on. Thank you, Zen. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Alex. Metaverse gaming is likely to play a very large part in the learning and development of the industry. And metaverse gaming is also likely to play a large part in brand promotion, advertising, and customer engagement across the entire customer life cycle. So there's a lot going on there. There's definitely money in them digital hills, my friends. That was My Digital World brought to us by Tempest Network. Definitely check out Boxing Boys at boxingboyswithaz.com and definitely head to tempest.network. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710. WR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions such as OGPay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OGPay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m., or you could head to 710WOR.iHeart.com forward slash a moment of zen. Remember that we're now live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern and on YouTube Sundays at 2 p.m. All episodes of A Moment of Zen are now available on demand or on our YouTube channel. Remember to check us out on our social media platforms at Zen Sams with an X. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. It has been an absolute pleasure being your host. Remember, happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it. Thanks again to all of our sponsors who continue to make this show possible. We'll be right back next week. Same time, same place.